I go to for guidance? I've got a good boss um, who I can get career advice from. When I need guidance, I'd go to somebody I love and trust. Because I don't know all the answers, so yeah, it's always good to go somewhere else. I don't think I have anybody like right now that I get guidance from. You have to look for it within yourself, because if you're looking for it in other people, you will never learn on your own. I seek counsel with my friends. If it's something that I really want to do, then if there is more cons and pros, I'll still do it anyway. <laughs> Somebody who knows more than me. And particularly my dad when it comes to girls. Uh, probably my dad, but I don't always take everything he says too literal. I always go to my friend whenever I need guidance or help or anything, because he's really smart and most importantly, he doesn't judge. Today, we are faced with a dazzling array of choices. In the average US supermarket, there are 48,750 items to choose from. And we all need guidance because we're all faced with decisions about what we do with our lives, our work, our life partners, uh, where we live, our money, as well as the day-to-day -day decisions that we face. Now, choice is a good thing, but it doesn't make the decisions any easier. So, does it matter? Is it all just random, or is there really some purpose to your life? It's been said that the two greatest days of your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. St. Paul writes, for we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. God created you. Your life does have a purpose. You're not an accident. Your life has significance. God has a specific, unique destiny for you and your life can make a difference. Sometimes this thought worries people that they might somehow mess things up and miss out on God's purpose, but that isn't the case. God's purpose for our lives is bigger than our mistakes. And in my own life, I've made lots of mistakes. There have been times when I've deliberately ignored God, times when I thought I'd just do my own thing because I thought that I knew best and I thought that I was strong enough to handle everything by myself. Ultimately, that ended up with me getting really hurt. So I was in a long-term relationship, which ended in a really painful breakup. And looking back now, I absolutely know that that relationship wasn't right for me, but I chose to ignore God. I felt so lost, but when I refocused on God, I knew that he loved me just as I was for who I am. And I felt lovable again. And I knew that I wasn't abandoned. Nelson Mandela said, don't judge me by my successes. Judge me by how many times I've fallen down and got back up again. You know, we had a sort of a heavy relationship, my mum and dad, and I never really got on with my father. And he was absent most of my life, actually, either drunk or having some affair, just awful. And then when I became a Christian, I wanted a relationship with my dad. I wanted him back in my life. I had to track him down, which I did, and he was living in a, a pensioner's flat in Macclesfield on his own. You know, I thought he'd have changed like I did. He hadn't. He was grumpier, he was older, he was drinking more, he was just vulgar, crude, you know, sarcastic. And he's exactly what I remembered. And I invited him down to our house, to our home in, in London and he'd get the train down and I'd meet him at Euston Station. And every time I'd meet him on, on the platform, I'd go and get him when he was coming off. He'd be whinging and moaning and complaining and slightly drunk. And one of the things he used to whinge about all the time was money. And then one day he came to stay and he'd, um, he got quite poorly and had to go to the local hospital. Ended up staying for a week. It was a nightmare. Um, and I wanted to get him back home when he was better. So we took him to Euston Station and I put him on the train uh, and sat him down. And right in the middle of the carriage, I had this over overwhelming feeling of love for my dad. And it was really weird. And I almost started to cry in the carriage. And I looked at him and I felt really sad for him. 
that we never had a relationship. I don't ever remember eating a meal with my father. All that stuff came up for me. And in my mind came this idea to upgrade his ticket to a first class ticket to Manchester. And, and I bought a very expensive single uh, first class ticket back to Manchester. And I walked him into the first class compartment and I sat him down and I kissed him on the head. And as we stood on the platform, Amanda said to me, what on earth are you doing? I said, you know what? I have no idea. I just really wanted to see my dad happy. And as I looked at him through, through the window of, of the carriage, I saw my father take his trilby off. He always wore a hat, take his trilby off and put it on the table. He hit the, the recline button and sort of leant back in the, the leather seat. And then he clicked his fingers and some of the waiters brought him a cup of tea and some biscuits. And then he got his newspaper out and started to read it. And as he was doing that, he just turned to look at me out of the window. And he had the biggest smile on his face that you could ever see. It's like every birthday and every Christmas had all come together. And he was beaming. And that was the last time that I ever saw my father. Three weeks later, he died of a, a, a massive heart attack on his own in that pensioner's flat. Now, I always think, was that me just making up an idea that I thought I might buy him a ticket? Or was that God guiding me? I have a real peace with my father through all those years of, of arguments and fighting and drinking and womanizing and, and, and just awful stuff. The only image I've got of my father is that picture of his face looking through that railway carriage as it drove off. I'm not very good at following directions. I'm always getting lost. So I find using a map really helpful. So every time I go the wrong way, it just keeps rerouting me. And it's infinitely patient. It just carries on finding a different way. Now, obviously, you can switch it off, you can ignore it. But if you follow it, generally, you'll have a much more enjoyable journey. And it's a bit like that with God. Obviously, the analogy breaks down because we're not dealing with a device. We're dealing with a person who loves us. This is a relationship with God. And he has a purpose for you. And he's infinitely patient. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. How in practice does God guide us? Well, it's a relationship, and he speaks to us. But how do we hear his voice? I found in practice there are five main ways in which God speaks to us. Sometimes it's just one of these ways. Sometimes for a very big decision, it might be all five. And the first one is commanding scripture. The psalmist says this, your word is a lamp to my feet and a guide to my path. The Bible is God speaking. And I've found in the time since I've been a Christian, this has been the main way in which God has guided me through his word. As we read this, we, we, we hear him speaking to us about his love for us, how we're his children, he loves us. We see that his purpose for all of us is to know his love for us and to respond by loving him. This is how we find the meaning and purpose of our lives in a love relationship with God. And then we're called to love other people, to love our family, to love our friends, to love our neighbor, to love our enemy. We can love in so many different ways. Little acts of kindness. So many people out there are really struggling in life. And little acts of kindness, they cost nothing, but they can make such a difference to a person's day or even their life. And then we see in this book that God's purpose for our lives is that we should become like Jesus. For example, that we should become people of integrity. There's some things that you really don't need to pray about. You don't need to pray about whether to, to pay your taxes or not. You don't need to say, Lord, you know, this year, should I pay my taxes or not? <laughs> it says in here that we are to pay our taxes. I heard of one man who just become a Christian. He wrote a letter to the Inland Revenue. He said this, Dear Sir, I have just become a Christian, and I found I cannot sleep at night. So here is a hundred pounds that I owe you. P.S. 
If I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> so we know from this book, from commanding scripture, these things. We know that God has good things for you to do in your life. You're not saved by doing good, but you are saved in order to do good. And God has a unique plan, purpose for you. He has good things uniquely for you to do. When it comes to looking for guidance, we might be tempted to pick up a Bible, flick to any page and point to a verse at random, hoping that it might speak to us, like a horoscope or a crystal ball. But that's not a good way of doing things because we might jump to the wrong conclusions about what God is trying to say to us. So how do you find out God's purpose for your life? The second way in which God guides us is through his compelling spirit. In Acts 20 verse 22, Paul says, and now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. One definition of a Christian is someone who is led by the Holy Spirit. When you encounter Jesus and invite his Spirit to come and live within you, his Spirit begins to speak to you, to guide you. Jesus says that his followers will recognize his voice. It's like if somebody you don't know rings you, you don't recognize their voice. If my wife Pippa rings me, the first syllable she says, I recognize her voice. And the more you get to know Jesus, the more you will recognize his voice. And the Holy Spirit speaks to us as we read the Bible and pray. In Acts 13 verse 2 it says, as they were worshiping the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. Prayer is, is a two-way conversation. It's like when you go to the doctor. You don't go to the doctor, just pour out all your requests, your complaints, and then walk out. You, you'll speak, but you'll also wait to hear what the doctor has to say to you. And it's the same when we're praying. It's not just that we're speaking to God, we're also listening to what God has to say to us. That's why I find it helpful always to have a pen or a notebook or a piece of paper. Just to, as I'm praying, as I'm reading the Bible, what is the Holy Spirit trying to say to me today? And then the Holy Spirit sometimes guides us by giving us a strong desire to do something. In Philippians 2 verse 13, Paul says, God works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Before I was a Christian, if you told me that I had to be a clergyman in the Church of England, I would have thought that was absolutely the worst thing I could ever imagine doing. It was so boring, so dreary, <laughs> such a ghastly job. The last thing on earth I wanted to do. But when the Spirit came to live within me, he gave me a strong desire to do what I'm doing now. And then God sometimes guides us in more unusual ways, prophecy, visions, pictures, dreams, impressions, or sometimes, on, to some people, even an audible voice. A few years ago, I was working as an English teacher in London, and I was hoping to move into a more business-centered role in communications. Back at university, I'd studied French, and I spent a year living in France, and I'd always wanted to go back and work there. And I remember one evening, I was invited to a meeting at church, my faith was actually pretty low at the time, but I agreed to go along anyway. And the person who was leading the meeting was this well-known church leader who was really widely respected for his spiritual discernment. After his talk, he said, I have a feeling that France is an important place for you. I remember thinking, that's interesting, but probably just a coincidence. Then a few of his team came up and asked if they could pray for me. One shared a Bible verse that had always meant a lot to me and another had an image that really struck a chord with me for personal reasons, again relating to France. I remember later praying and saying to God, okay God, if this is you and this is right, I need more confirmation. I need a job in France and I need a job that allows me to work in business communications. Well, soon after that, I met up with a friend I hadn't seen for a while and I told him about my dream job scenario and he said, that's weird. 
I was just talking to my aunt, who runs a company that specialises in corporate communications right near Paris. So I got her details. I sent her my resume. I got an interview and was offered a job at the business school in corporate training. Looking back, I realised that God was guiding me in all sorts of different ways, through the Bible, through prayer, through other Christians, through circumstances. It didn't mean that everything was easy. I had to push doors, I had to keep trusting, even when it was difficult. But it showed me that God is able to guide us in our decisions. The third way God guides us is through the counsel of the saints. In other words, advice from other Christians. And that's what's special about church, to be part of a community of other Christians where we can help one another. In Proverbs it says, the wise listen to advice. And I'd encourage you to search out the people who have wisdom and experience and listen to their advice and make an informed decision. Ultimately, of course, the final decision is yours, but it's wise to seek advice. So, how do you know when it's God speaking to you through the Spirit and through your friends, and not just you thinking what you want to. Of course, it's possible to make mistakes or misinterpret what we've heard, but the Bible helps you to test whether what you've heard is right. St. John says, test the spirits to see whether they're from God. So, first, is it in line with what the Bible tells us? Second, is it strengthening, encouraging, comforting? Does it promote love? If it's not loving, then it hasn't come from God. Third, do you feel a sense of God's peace about the decision? Paul writes, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. So if you don't feel peaceful about it, then it's probably not right. The fourth way God guides is through your common sense. Now, you don't lose all your logic and reason when you become a Christian, you are still you. God's promises of guidance were not given to save us the problem of thinking. The Bible tells us the general will of God. We know, for example, that singleness is a high calling. Jesus wasn't married, but in general, marriage is the norm. But the Bible won't tell us who we should marry. You have to use your common sense and ask yourself, well, are we compatible? It's the same in career decisions. You know, sometimes after people come to faith, they sometimes wonder, should I leave my job? Well, St. Paul says each of you should retain the place in life that the Lord has assigned to you and to which God has called you. Each of you should remain in the situation which you were in when God called you. God has called you to that job for a purpose. So the general rule is stay exactly where you are until God calls you into something else. And whatever God calls you into will be something that suits your temperament, your, your personality, your education and skills. And you can ask yourself, well, what do I like doing? What are my gifts and passions and what can I do well? And the final way that God guides us is through circumstantial signs. Sometimes we're faced with a really difficult decision. We might say to God, I don't know which direction to go. I don't know whether this is the right relationship or not, or this job is right, or I don't even know whether this is the right decision or not. Well, Proverbs 16, 9 says, in your heart, you may plan your course, but the Lord determines your steps. And Psalm 37, 5 says, Commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will act. Because God can shut doors or He can open doors. And the key is to commit the decision to Him and then trust Him with the result. So we need to watch the circumstances, but just not put too much weight on them. Sometimes we need to persevere in spite of the circumstances. So basically, God draws alongside us and He takes our ordinary stuff and He turns it into something beautiful. And he doesn't do it instead of us, he tells us to keep going and he works with us. In the mid-19th century, the British aristocrat Lord Radstock was staying in a hotel in Norway. One evening, he heard the sound of a piano being played horribly in the hallway downstairs. He looked and saw a little girl who was making the most terrible noise. He was normally a patient man, but slowly the continuous racket began to drive him mad. As he watched, a man approached and sat down beside her. Rather than stop the little girl's efforts, the man began to play, constructing chords alongside her. With each keystroke, his playing complemented her notes, and suddenly a breathtaking sound filled the whole hotel. He took her mistakes and discord and turned it into something utterly beautiful. As Lord Radstock later found out, 
the man playing alongside the girl was her father, the famous 19th century Russian composer, Alexander Borodin. Often as we look back, we can see that God can use our mistakes, and goodness, I've made so many of them. God didn't put me in prison, I did. God didn't make me get two divorces, I did. But he's helped me all the way, th all the way through it. You know, dysfunctional parents, alcoholics, thrown out when I was 15 through an argument with my father, uh, moved into a squat with a, with a gang, got in trouble with the police, ended up with a prison sentence, came out of there, joined the army at 21, uh, two marriages, two divorces, almost alcoholic, from being bullied at school to joining the army boxing team and being a bully in a uniform. My mother died. Um, I hadn't seen my mum since I was a kid. She got ill. She had cancer. My mum and dad were both heavy smokers and heavy drinkers. Uh, long story short, again, she got put into hospital. I had about 10 days with her and she died. She had a massive sort of um, tumour and, uh, and just fell asleep in, in my arm. And that was a catalyst for me, really, to, um, to start thinking about stuff. And that set me on the journey. And then shortly after that, a friend of mine said, you've got lots of questions. You should probably try an Alpha course. You know, 16 years in the army. I've jumped out of airplanes. I've done rifle courses. I've done military. I've done courses on everything. I'll do a course on God. And I remember just sitting there listening to these talks. And I thought, do you know what? I'd never heard any of this stuff. It was all completely new to me. And, uh, and I prayed. And my prayer was, if you're up there and all this stuff is true and you can make me a better man, you can make me a better character, you know, you could make me a, hopefully a faithful husband, a good father, someone who people would like, then you know what, let's go for it. And then things started to change. Really weird stuff was going through my head. You know, I thought, I've lived with my girlfriend eight years. Maybe we should get married. We talked about it. And we got married. Prayed and got my son back in my life who we left when he was three. He's now 36 and living with us. And now I've got a 18 year old daughter who's gorgeous. I mean, if you'd have told me, you know, a few years ago that I would be a vicar in the Church of England, I'd have said, you're completely crazy. It was the furthest thing from my, it wasn't even in my mind. I still have to pinch myself at, at times. So I'm working with people now who really I've been around most of my life. A lot of people I can relate to. I work with the homeless, those affected with mental health issues, those in prison, those coming out of prison through a charity called Care Infects Offenders. And I was presented with a, an MBE for, for me, which I think is really exciting for working with ex-offenders. And to be honored like that is, is extraordinary. And it's what God says, I have a good and perfect plan for your life, plan to prosper you and not to harm you, plan to give you hope and a future. And he says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And, and that for me is what, what keeps me going. Often it's as you look back on your life that you see God has been guiding you. He has a purpose for your life. And as you read the Bible, as you listen to the Spirit, as you talk to friends, as you think and watch, your life has a purpose. And you'll make a difference and you'll have a greater impact than you probably ever realise. And one day God will say to you, well done, you've reached your destination.